What is up, people? Welcome back. In the last video, we talked about measuring the terrifying beast that is inflation. We aren't ready to learn yet how to tame that beast, but we'll talk about why it's so scary and just how frightened of it we should be. And don't be scared to smash that like button. Okay, so we know that inflation is a sustained increase in the overall price level. And we probably have the basic intuition that people don't like it when prices go up. So far, so good. But imagine for a moment that you woke up tomorrow and the price of everything had doubled overnight. But before you panic and feel really poor, what if your wage also doubled and the money in your bank account doubled? In fact, every single thing that is measured in dollars doubled. How would this affect your life? The answer is that it wouldn't affect you very much. Yeah, it's true that you'd have to pay twice as much for everything, but since your money and wealth also doubled, your purchasing power didn't actually change. You can still afford everything you could before. This is a really important insight to understand. It isn't actually the inflation that's destructive. It's the rate of inflation that matters. In real life, prices don't just instantly double. The prices of different things change at all kinds of different rates. Some things get way more expensive. The price of other things rises a little, and the price of other things even falls, all at the same time. With that as background, let's drill down a little bit further on this concept of the costs of inflation. One really important thing to point out is that inflation does not affect everybody equally, like in our thought experiment. Some people will be harmed, while others will actually benefit. Well, how can this be? Imagine that inflation is unexpected. This gets to a concept that will become very important later in the year about inflationary expectations. It turns out that our expectations of what inflation will be in the future are actually very, very important, and we make lots of decisions based on those expectations. For example, suppose that everybody expects 5% inflation next year. Workers will demand a 5% increase in their pay, not as a raise, but just so that their paycheck provides them the same purchasing power that it does right now. This is often known as a cost of living adjustment. Employers are willing to pay 5% more for wages because they expect to be able to raise their prices by 5% and so on. But now imagine that inflation ends up being higher than anybody expected. Let's say it's 10%. Who's better off and who's worse off because of this? Well, if you sign a contract agreeing to receive a 5% increase in pay this year, you're actually worse off if prices rise by 10%. Yes, your check is bigger, but because prices have risen more than your wage, your purchasing power has actually decreased. See how sneaky inflation can be? The employer, on the other hand, is better off because she's now paying you a wage that has less purchasing power. And in a real sense, the amount the firm is paying in wages has decreased. Test questions like to focus on borrowers and lenders the most. Unexpected inflation benefits borrowers and harms lenders. The reason for this again comes down to the purchasing power of the dollars being borrowed and paid back. A borrower benefits from unexpectedly high inflation because when they pay back the loan, they're paying it back with less valuable dollars, dollars that don't have as much purchasing power as the money they originally borrowed. Lenders, on the other hand, are harmed by this unanticipated inflation since they are the ones receiving the less valuable dollars. Basically, anybody who's paying a fixed amount of dollars benefits when the dollars they're paying back become less valuable, whereas anybody who's receiving a fixed amount of dollars is harmed since they're being paid with less valuable dollars. Therefore, unexpected inflation arbitrarily redistributes wealth from one group to another. Additionally, there are three other costs imposed by inflation that we want to consider specifically. Shoe leather costs refer to the increased transaction costs that result because a price level is rising so rapidly. For example, in 1923 Germany, workers were being paid as often as three times a day because prices were rising so quickly that the only way people would work was to be paid that frequently. They'd leave work and run to the store and buy goods immediately. They were literally wearing out their shoes, making all those extra transactions that were directly caused by the hyperinflation giving this term its name. Today, it might not be as literal, but the idea that high inflation causes people to alter their behavior as a response to the inflation is definitely still true today. Menu costs refer to the resources that are used to change prices as a response to the inflation. 
You can think of it most literally with restaurants or grocery stores frequently changing their prices and therefore needing to print new menus or new price tags. This negatively affects economic activity because stores only need to do this as a response to inflation, and it's diverting people away from doing things that are actually productive. Unit of account costs are probably the trickiest to explain at this point in the year since we haven't learned about the roles of money yet but I'll do my best to make this one simple. The idea is that one of the roles of money is that it helps us compare the relative value of very different things. Imagine there's no such thing as money for a minute, and I ask you, what is a pound of steak worth? Your answer cannot be expressed in dollars anymore or any currency. You might say it's worth five minutes of a doctor's labor, or it's worth one eighth of a PS5 video game, or worth three minutes of an econ lesson. But you see my point, it's tough, right? Money allows us to make those comparisons easily. We say, oh yeah, a stake is $10. Inflation, though, makes those relative comparisons a little less reliable. As it is, we all have an idea of what $100 is worth right now. But if we experience high inflation for a little while, it wouldn't take long before our shared understanding of what $100 is worth would fall apart. So basically, inflation messes up this role of money. And lastly, on a similar note, Inflation sends confusing signals to everybody in a market. If the price of eggs goes up 10%, is it because consumers really want more eggs? Or is it because the money supply has increased by too much and people are spending the extra money by buying more of everything? The reason this matters so much is because farmers need to decide if they should be increasing production of eggs because there's been a real increase in demand, or if this price spike is actually just caused by inflation. And if that brings up a bunch of other questions in your mind about the causes of inflation, well, that's good. It drives me kind of crazy, but you'll have to wait until units four and five to really get into the causes of inflation. So stick with me, won't you? Until next time, this has been a La Money Production. And thanks again for watching. Please hit that like button. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Ring the bell for notifications and check out the description to get links to the answers to these practice questions, as well as some of the great study aids I've made for you. And I will see you in the next video.